morning, everybody. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 9. So please uh, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. And you can see we're going to read verses 23 through 28. As uh, frequently happens when you have a situation like this where we're not continuing a series, but uh, we're sort of parachuting in on a text. Uh, it requires a little uh, background. So the, the context here as we come to uh, Hebrews chapter 9, uh, the author of Hebrews has been talking about blood and the relationship of blood to forgiveness and also the relationship that blood has to the biblical covenants. And specifically, he has been contrasting the blood of animals with the blood of of Christ. Now, this is a topic that doesn't resonate with unbelievers. Uh, I think if one came in with no knowledge of the Bible, he might be, he or she might be tempted to get up and leave right now. But, uh, and the, but there, even there are many uh, believers who don't really understand this. Uh, but the, uh, the, the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews has argued in verse 13 through 14, I want you to look at that please, he has argued from the lesser to the greater, if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of of the flesh. The context is probably someone has become ceremonially unclean because they've been in contact with a dead body. So if the blood of these animals sanctifies for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more, he says, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your consciences from dead works to serve the living God. So he has argued that, that argument from the lesser to the greater. And then next, uh, he reviews how blood was an essential element in the great covenants made between God and his chosen people in these verses leading up to our passage this morning, verses 15 through 22, concluding in verse 22, that all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And that is, of course, a very familiar verse uh, for all of us here at Believer's Chapel. It's one we're quite familiar with, and it holds forth a remarkable truth that both in a physical sense, but especially in a spiritual sense, blood atonement is necessary in order for a mortal person to have forgiveness of sins and an unfettered relationship with our Creator God. There's no other way for us to have that relationship with Him. And so our title today is A Better Sacrifice. Beginning in verse 23, Let's read it together. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So he mentions copies, and uh, that's been his topic in chapter 8 and chapter 9, these copies of things as compared to the real things. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands. And forgive me, but let's go back to verse 11 of this chapter where he made that point. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation. So he picks up that idea again here in verse uh, 24. Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear 
in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. And again, he has made this point already in this chapter in verses 7 and 8. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages... He has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Well, it's, it's necessary, I'm afraid, uh, to provide a little more background before we launch into these verses. Uh, the book of Hebrews is in many ways a book about contrast. Uh, it's true that its great theme is the superiority of Christ, but that very idea involves contrast. He is superior in contrast to the prophets, in contrast to the angels, in contrast to Moses, in contrast to Aaron. And when you come to the 11th chapter, that glorious chapter, the anthology there of the great men and women of faith, uh, Abraham and Moses and Rahab and the others, there is a strong sense there of the contrast between this world, the material world, and the world to come. Abraham was looking for the city which has foundations. Uh, Moses was looking for something greater than the treasures of Egypt. The world they labored in paled in significance in contrast to the world to come. So to some degree, I think it's fair to say there is something artificial about the world that we wake up to every day. It's not quite real. Uh, which is not to say that our existence is not real. We really do exist. But real life is lived in the presence of God with real access to Him. An amazing thing to ponder that we may have actual access to Almighty God. Well, as we approach this text, we near the end of a long section that deals with the superiority of the priesthood of Jesus Christ to the priesthood of the Old Testament. That is the priesthood that was instituted under the law of Moses and restricted to the tribe of Levi, you remember, and more specifically to the line of Aaron. And that section is a large section in this book of the Bible. It runs from around chapter 4, verse 10, or 14, to chapter 10, verse 18. And if you know anything about the Old Testament at all, you know that the priests played a primary role in the people's worship of God. God gave them the priesthood. Uh, Perhaps uh, you've been reading through the Bible uh, this year, and maybe you've been, shall I use the phrase, laboring through uh, Leviticus and Numbers And we've seen God repeat over and over again through Moses his provision of the priesthood. And his purpose in giving it to them was to provide someone to represent them before him, to give them access to him. And what we learn from the author of Hebrews is that what was involved in the Aaronic priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron, was not just the priests, but also the covenant under which it was instituted, the sanctuary in which it was practiced, and the sacrifices that were offered. And those elements form something of a structure, an outline uh, to the epistle. What was in the background of the author's mind in these chapters was the annual Day of Atonement, that one day per year when the high priest entered into the innermost chamber of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, 
to offer the blood on the altar before God in order to provide atonement for the sins of himself and the people for the year. And with this as his background, he makes several wonderful conclusions about the ministry of Christ as priest in contrast to the priestly ministry under the Mosaic law, the ministry they were all used to, the ministry like we're used to these pews and the things that we do here. Uh, but he, he makes several points about the superiority of Christ's priesthood uh, to that. One thing he has pointed out, and I've already said, is that the priesthood that belongs to Jesus is superior to the Aaronic priesthood. It is of a different order altogether, uh, more like that of that ancient king, priest, Melchizedek, and it has primacy over all the Levitical priesthood. Secondly, the sacrifice that he offered is contrasted with the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament, of the Old Covenant. His sacrifice is better because it was the sacrifice of himself, the perfect Son of God, whose blood, consequently, had infinite value. Therefore, thirdly, believers possess now a high priest who serves forever in the real sanctuary, operating under a better covenant, having offered a sacrifice that truly satisfies the righteous demands of our holy God. And lastly, what the priesthood and sanctuary and sacrifices and ceremonies of the law only pointed to, only pictured, only foreshadowed, Jesus Christ really fulfilled. In the person and work of Christ, we see and experience the real thing, a real atonement, real access to God, real representation and advocacy before God in the very presence of God. And that has been the topic of much of this section of the epistle to the Hebrews, that uh, there are copies or shadows, the various elements of the mosaic priestly cult, as the scholars call it, the priestly practice, and then there is their fulfillment in Christ and his saving work. Particularly, he's been speaking of the role of blood in the priestly work. Because of sin, our relationship with God has been broken. The, the most fundamental thing uh, that the Bible presents to us. It's because of our sin, our relationship with God has uh, been uh, broken. And there is no forgiveness. We need forgiveness. There is no forgiveness apart from a penalty paid, the shedding of blood. The old covenant provided for that blood atonement, just as was pictured in the rituals of the Day of Atonement, and it provided a cleansing of a sort, but it was more of an external cleansing, as he wrote in verse 13 of, of our chapter, a cleansing of the flesh, not a true spiritual cleansing that penetrates to our very consciences. It was a cleansing that had to do with the realm of the copies, not the reality. It satisfied the obligations placed upon them by what was an inferior covenant, inferior in the sense that it was unable to provide true forgiveness. And that's what we're to understand when we come here to verse 23. Now we're in our text, and we read, Therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. He's expressed that already in uh, that idea of the copy versus the reality in chapter 8 when he refers in verse 2 to the true tabernacle as opposed to the earthly copy. And in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 8, speaking of the priests, who in their ceremonial offerings were a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Now some have tried to parse this statement of verse 23 that the heavenly things must be cleansed 
uh, to finally asking how is it that heavenly things have to be cleansed? It's an exegetical question that has uh, yielded numerous answers. But the point, here's the point. The point is very simple. The blood of the new covenant is absolutely superior to the blood of the old covenant. The blood of bulls and goats served its purpose. Uh, the fleshly, temporary ritual <coughs> cleansing required by the law, yet it could not actually take away the sin that prevents our access to God. But Jesus' blood, inaugurating the new covenant, can. It's in that sense that the heavenly things themselves were cleansed with better sacrifices than those of the old covenant. Well, if you let your uh, eyes wander up to verse 15, please, you'll see the link between the blood of Christ uh, mentioned in verse 14 as the instrument of our complete spiritual cleansing, the link between his blood and the new covenant. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place, for the transgressions committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. An eternal inheritance. Uh, the very thought uh, boggles the mind for eternity and an inheritance as a gift from God. But here in verse 15, uh, we see this new covenant again. The author has already spent the better part of the eighth chapter uh, mining the Old Testament scriptures to highlight God's persistent promise of this new covenant. It was to be a, a covenant marvelous in mercy and, and forgiveness and security, the culmination of all that God had ever intended for his people, far superior to the old covenant. Can you imagine the emotions running through the Lord Jesus when he sat at the table at the Last Supper and he took that cup of wine and he held it up and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. The moment had come. Notice how the author mentions in verse 26, the consummation of the ages. The consummation of the ages. Here was the eternal Son of God, uh, once a present and signatory, so to speak, to the eternal covenant of redemption made between the three persons of the Trinity to secure the salvation of a vast throng of sinful humanity, now being condescended to become man himself, bound by time like we are, it's 1022, Jesus Christ was bound by time like we are, and now the time had come. What our triune God had determined was necessary, according to verse 23, is about to be realized in this created time and space that we mortals live in, a better sacrifice was about to be offered. I'm not sure we can describe what our Lord felt at that moment, but he must have, it must have been a very moving moment for him in his humanity as he passed that cup to his disciples. And of course, we'll have opportunity later this morning to remember that. So it was necessary for the heavenly things themselves to be cleansed with the better sacrifice that he would make. And verse 24 explains why it was necessary. That's what the introductory four indica indicates. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The reason a better sacrifice was needed was that it was the, the one that really did open up the way to access with God. 
our Lord had an important, important appearance to make. He was to appear before God, toting his sinful people along with him. And animal sacrifices that were only symbols of the true sacrifice that was necessary simply would not suffice. What Christ did was not a symbolic enactment, a copy of what is real, but he really did. He really does appear before God to represent us. There's a vast difference between the entrance of an earthly priest who is a sinner himself into a material structure that only corresponds in some shadowy way to where God dwells and the entrance of the sinless, perfect high priest who actually does appear before God. What a vast difference that is. Think of it this way. Some of you are architects, some of you are involved in design, and so it's fine to take a pen or pencil and a straight edge, or obviously computers, and put down on paper uh, the plans for what the building or the home is going to look like, how it's going to be constructed. And then to display it very proudly and say, uh, see, here's, here's what it's going to look like. I'm in the real estate business. I work with retailers. Uh, some of the retail uh, uh, tenants that we've worked with, very complicated, putting grocery stores in a vast complex with office towers and, and residential towers and underground parking. And you see all the manipulations, everything that goes into it's quite amazing. And then at the end, it's done. And here are the plans. Here are the plans and specs for this building. But when the time comes to bring those plans to fruition, uh, the copies take a back seat. You need uh, the realities. My wife and my daughter are, are decorators. They spend out, countless countless hours uh, looking at pretty things and, and pretty rooms and, and pretty houses. But the truth is they care very little about the plans. Uh, they, they care about them, but not as much. It's when the plans become real that they get interested or in how the plans become real. Well, further, unlike the high priest of old who entered into the inner room of the tabernacle by himself, and all others were strictly prohibited from following him. When Christ entered in, he opened up the way for a great multitude of people to follow him into the very presence of God, to boldly approach the throne of grace. As he says here, he appears now in the presence of God for us. That is, he appears there not just for himself, he is there for us. He is there for you. He is there for me before God in heaven. This is one of the truly wonderful things about what our Lord has done for us. And we ought to wonder, especially at those times perhaps when we find our struggle with sin to be most frustrating in our own personal lives. We ought to wonder, to think that sinners like us could actually approach that throne of grace where Christ is continually pleading his own blood shed on our behalf and we can have fellowship with him. It's that strange truth that challenges our minds but is nevertheless true that those who have been saved through faith in Jesus Christ are, as the, the theologians like to say, at the same time both justified and a sinner. And so though in this life we're never entirely free from sin and imperfection, Christ lives to be an advocate for us, pleading his finished work on the cross that purchased for us forgiveness and eternal redemption. So what Christ did in his priestly work 
on the cross was not just a symbolic representation, a copy of what is real, but he really does appear before God to represent us. What a glorious thing that is. And verse 25 continues the argument in pointing out that his work is to be further distinguished from that of the earthly priests in that they brought blood for atonement that was not their own. But with Christ, unlike the atonement represented in the priestly sacrificial offerings of the Old Covenant, which because of their inadequacy had to be repeated over and over again, his atoning offering was the real thing in that it was of himself, an offering of infinite value, uh, the one time and final offering of the age when he appeared to take away sin. Here's verse 25, nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He was not like those priests who preceded him. If he had been like them, then he would have had to offer himself over and over and over again, like the priests of old did. But his offering of himself was the only offering that could truly put away sin. And that was the reason he became man and experienced all the trials and suffering that he underwent, that he might do that, that he might offer himself the sufficient atoning sacrifice for sins. And that's why the author calls it the consummation of the ages. Because his incarnation and his suffering and death on the cross was the climax of all of human history. It was the fullness of time that God, that, that came when God sent forth his son. The climax of human history. What could be more important than that? Every day we turn on the news and there's some climax, climactic thing going on. Uh, we had a climactic 2020. It looks like we're having a climactic 2021. We can go back to landmark years in our lives and landmark years in history. Uh, but this was the climax of all human history, the consummation of the ages, the putting away of sin by the offering of himself. That is the most important thing. Now, that's why the teaching ministry of Believer's Chapel is so cross-emphatic, so infused with the gospel message. I would say it's one of the, the great privileges of my life to get to teach the Bible here at Believer's Chapel. And as you know, there is a difference between studying and teaching through books of the Bible and getting to hear week by week uh, Dan Duncan, someone like Dan, uh, teach you every week. What I mean by that, there's something about preparing and teaching that makes you think more and, and be more aware of what the content of the passages and the content of the teaching is. I, I mean, only that sometimes the thought occurs to me while I'm preparing, am I saying the same thing again this week that I said uh, the, the last time. Uh, but the reality is, in some sense, we do say the same thing week after uh, week. Uh, I know many of you listen to Dr. Johnson's messages or you read them from online. I do. And listening to him and then these last many years listening uh, to Dan, Sunday by Sunday you realize what a crucial role the most important thing is in their preaching. That's the, that's the point of it. They are always talking about what God did at the consummation of the ages. 
There was an article in the paper I read <clears throat> some time ago. I think I'm all right. Uh, there was an article in the paper I read uh, about a minister, and this was some time ago because this came out of my notes from several years ago. So this has nothing to do with 2016 or 2020. But the article was about a minister in California who had gotten involved in trying to promote one of the Republican candidates uh, for president. And, oh, he used church stationery and an internet radio program to endorse the candidacy of this one man that he uh, had attached himself to. And of course, the Americans United for the Separation of Church and State got involved and they filed a complaint against him with the IRS calling upon the agency to revoke the church's tax-exempt status because they'd gotten involved in endorsing political candidates and blah, blah, blah. We know all about this. And so the minister uh, began calling for his followers to pray for all kinds of bad things to happen to the people who were pursuing the action against him. And the headline, here's my point, the headline of the article read, Minister calls for death prayers over IRS <laughs> complaint. <laughs> I mean, which of us hasn't been guilty of, the, of that kind of thing? And you know, I don't want to denigrate in any way political uh, involvement. We talk about this enough. We don't have to continually ask your forgiveness for it. Uh, I think Christians should be involved in the political process, but there are things uh, that actually are more important. And when a preacher loses focus on the most important things, he often ends up discrediting the gospel. You read the gospels, you don't see Jesus worrying himself too much over politics. I don't think he would, didn't think that it, what happened in government wasn't important. But he didn't, we don't have much of anything he said about it. And you read the New Testament epistles and you see what interested the apostles and it is not a political affairs. They, they were much too engrossed in what had happened at the consummation of the ages. Now, what often happens to preachers when they lose that focus and get sidetracked on peripheral things is that they end up bringing needless ridicule and even dishonor to what truly is the most important thing. So this little side thing. It's not about what we do politically or, or our activities. It's really about the important thing, the most important thing. Uh, I'd say this to any believer, not just preachers. However you decide to pursue your particular passion for public affairs, and I've got a wife sitting here who knows I'm very passionate about it, uh, be very careful that you don't jeopardize your ability to proclaim the most important thing. Well, I want to now point out an interesting theme, a link that runs through these verses in our passage. It's not as clear in the New American Standard Version as it is in the NIV and the, in the authorized version. It's what's been called the three appearances of Jesus. You see them in serial order, we might say. Uh, first, in the last clause of verse 24, where Christ appears in the presence of God for us. Then in verse 26, at the consummation of the ages, when he has been manifested to put away sin, and the NIV reads, has appeared, a second appearance of that word appeared. And then lastly, in verse 28, uh, the last occurrence of the word when Christ will appear a second time for salvation. Now, all three are different words in the original, and there are different nuances to each that could be brought out uh, with time, which we don't have this morning. But we should at least note that the order of the appearances as they come to us in the text is not the same as the actual order of Christ's appearances. His first appearance would really be the one mentioned second in verse 26, his appearing in human flesh in order to die on the cross and take away our sin. His second one then would actually be the first one cited here in verse 24, how Christ even now appears in the presence of God 
for us. And then the last appearance of Christ is also the last one we read of here and the one we come to now in the last two verses, verse 27. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Since God has ordained that every human is to die one time and then be judged, and Jesus was human, the only thing remaining in the priestly work of Christ is for him to appear a last time, as, as humans also do, but for judgment, to finally save the many he died for who are eagerly awaiting him, sin no longer an issue to our access to God. So there is both this similarity and contrast again. Uh, like humans who only die once, Jesus was a human too, and therefore could not have needed to suffer death more than once. But there is the contrast too. It is appointed for men to die. That is the lot uh, of all humanity. It's what Moses saw so vid vividly in the wilderness uh, wanderings of Israel as one by one the multitude who had come out of Egypt breathed their last. And so he wrote in Psalm, chapter no Psalm 90, you turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of men. All our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. And after death, there is judgment. That's the sworn testimony to mankind from God about what the future holds. But there is a difference for those who, as he says here, eagerly await him. At the cross, Jesus dealt with sin finally. When he appears the last time, it will be apart from sin. When he comes again, it will be to save those for whom he made the ultimate sacrifice. But for those who rejected him, there will be only that fearful expectation of judgment. There will be judgment for men and women who die because they're sinners who have not believed in Christ and who have not been born again to a living hope. But there will be salvation, look, that's what he says. There will be salvation for many. That's the word he uses there in the last verse. Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many. And that's striking, you know, because it recalls the words of Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant song, verses 10 and 11, where we read, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his day. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. I, I think the author must have had, the author of Hebrews must have had that Isaiah passage in mind. He will see his offspring. That is, he will appear for salvation to those who eagerly await him. He will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. That is, that is Christ who was offered once to bear the sins of many. He put away our sins so that we might indeed look forward to his coming again, knowing that it is salvation not judgment. What a wonderful thought. It is salvation, not judgment, that awaits us. A glorious hope, a far better than the best of this world, and that puts the trials and pains of this world in perspective. As the apostle wrote, well, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the unseen things are eternal. Well, like the Jews of old, 
who stood outside the tabernacle, picture them, waiting for the high priest to reappear from within, where he had gone in with blood, uh, bearing their names upon him. And when he reemerged, they rejoiced. So our true high priest has gone into the presence of God and his people wait expectantly for him to reappear. That's the kind of life we ought to live. Uh, real life is lived, as we've been reminded in our study in the Sermon on the Mount. Real life is lived in the presence of God and in the expected hope of what that will mean to us for eternity. Like Abraham, like Moses, who desired not the artificial, but the real. And so may God uh, give each one of us such a heart as we live for real things, looking forward to real life, eagerly awaiting him who is for us and put away our sin by the sacrifice of himself. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for this wonderful truth, these wonderful truths. Uh, what a blessing that you are for us. What a blessing that we have a Savior who provided a better sacrifice, certainly we might say the best sacrifice, the only efficient sacrifice for sin. And therefore, we are able, as we do now, to approach your throne of grace, recognizing that it is a throne of grace, and that is pictured fully in the person and work of your son, Jesus. We pray in his name, and we pray, Lord, that perhaps if there are any who are hearing these words who uh, do not know you and have not placed their faith in a high priest who truly offered an effectual sacrifice, that they would do that. Flee to Christ, trust in him, enjoy the forgiveness and inheritance for eternity that belongs to those who do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.